This video is not going to be about getting the most fancy data science degree or a data analytics certificate. It's about something else. Let's get it, shall we? Hi everyone, welcome back to another video on data analysis and data science. My name is Tuvu, I'm a data science consultant, and in this video, I want to share with you five ways for you to stand out as a junior data scientist or data analyst. Well, apart from dressing up. Anyone can put R or Python or whatever fancy languages in their resumes, but the thing is, not everyone knows how to write readable and efficient code and be productive in their work. And that's where you can distinguish yourself, learn best coding practices. Surprisingly, you hardly see any online programming courses in R or Python actually cover this. And some people might think, well, you're not a software developer, then why bother this? But the truth is, everyone can benefit from writing better code. And this is going to be one of the things that uh, will define you as a junior or more senior data analyst or scientist. While this would deserve a whole video of its own, but let me give you a few good examples. The first thing that's going to make your code instantly more readable, more professional and elegant is to stick to a coding style. For example, for Python, you can use PEP8, which is the most popular style. And for R, the Google style guide is a nice style to use. The second thing is learning coding principles. One of the most important principles is don't repeat yourself. That means you should avoid copy paste your code here and there and repeat yourself over again. You should probably write a function that can be reused in different parts of your code. And by doing this, you can avoid creating typos or errors in your analysis or simple things like using naming conventions. It's going to make your code more readable if you stick to only one naming convention throughout your code. Another thing about naming is that it's it's always better to create meaningful names instead of some arbitrary names that can cause confusion later on. To be honest, I used to be quite lazy when it comes to naming things, but then every time when I had to review my code, I just want to hit my head with a pillow. Like, I was so annoyed with my lazy past self. Another important coding practice is commenting your code, which is so important and many of us often forget to do, or more precisely, often feel too lazy to do. But it should be the minimum requirement to write a short documentation, a list for the main analysis steps you took and for all the functions you write, describing what the input and output are and what it does in one or two sentences. We as humans always overestimate our memory and we end up wasting our time trying to figure out what we did. So remember to comment your code and organize it before it gets out of hand and becomes a mess. Also talking about function, your function should only do one thing. If it's doing too many things, it will be really hard to be reused because you often need to adapt it somehow whenever there's a small change in the logic within a function. If you think your function is getting too big or doing too many things, you probably need to chop it into smaller chunks and keep things simple. In coding term, it's called refactoring. Also, it's a good practice to keep an eye on the performance of the code. If a data preprocessing step is taking hours to run, that's a sign that you probably need to optimize it a bit more. And that means to utilize vectorized operations and avoid writing loops. For example, in base R, we have the apply function family, or in Python, we have the lambda function, filter, map, and reduced, etc. This would save you from having to write for loops to do the same operation on each element of a list or each column of a data frame. If you want to develop even further in coding best practices, some knowledge in object-oriented programming, parallelization, or unit testing will definitely be helpful if you have a larger scale project or if you have the ambitions to create your own R or Python packages. But I think that would be the topics for the future videos and you probably don't need it just yet. The second tip I have for you is to learn to use Git version control if you haven't already. If you end up working in a data science team, it would be very surprising if they don't use Git. Git is basically a free open source software for tracking changes in files. It is used for coordinating work among programmers who are working collaboratively together. 
Git is definitely a necessity when your project is complex and contributed by many people concurrently, for example, in a team. You might have been in a frustrating situation where you suddenly get different results by running the same code, or maybe you get an error that didn't exist before. Perhaps you or your teammate, yes, most likely your teammate, made some changes by mistake, or maybe due to some lack of coffee, you decide to delete your whole code file. It would be a nightmare. I've done it before. In all these situations, Git can save you from all the headaches. Nothing is unrecoverable by Git. So I would recommend you to use version control not only in your team, but also when you're working locally just by yourself. It can be a bit scary if you've never used command line before, but basically to use Git, you just need to download the software from the Git website, install it, and know how to use the most basic comments. I promise you this is all you need 80 or 90% of the times. This free Git book gives you a bit more background and shows you more advanced use of Git. I put the link in the video description. The next point I want to talk about is to level up your data visualization skills because that's the best tool to communicate insights and findings from your data. Anyone can learn Power BI or Tableau, but to stand out with your skills, I think you need to go beyond that. You really need to understand how to present information in a way that is accurate and impactful. There are good visualizations and bad visualizations. Good visualizations are convincing, easy to understand, while bad visualizations visualizations, as you can imagine, are confusing, misleading, hard to understand, or even completely wrong. I hope these examples give you a better idea of what good data visualization looks like. There are many good books about data visualization out there. I would recommend you to start with Storytelling with Data by Cole Naflick to give you some good foundation. If you're more into creating unique and more creative types of visualization, one of my favorite books is Visualize This by Nathan Yeo. It's a great book that touched upon a lot of advanced topics and it shows you a lot of useful insights and a wide range of tools that you can use for data visualization. This book is a lot of fun and Nathan Yeo also has a website and it's pretty awesome. I still remember in my first job as a data analyst, I was the most junior person in my team. And once I decided to create a heat map of neighborhoods in Amsterdam based on a clustering analysis I did on neighborhood data set, my boss back then was very, very impressed. And he told me he showed this to everyone he talked to. It was quite amazing to see how impactful these visualizations can be. And you can be really proud of what you made. In terms of tooling, I think it's best to equip yourself with the ability to use some more customizable visualization tools, such as some specialized libraries in R, Python, or JavaScript. If you were to advance yourself in the data science field, you're going to need them at some point where the standard visualization in Power BI or Tableau are not enough anymore. All right, on to the next tip. It's about getting help. The reason I think this is so important is that a lot of people are like, Oh, you are a data analyst or data scientist, so you can do magic on the data and turn it to gold and find some great insights. The answer is no. It's almost never the case that a data analyst or data scientist can just work alone. They also need help from people who know the business and know the domain. It's unfortunately a common situation you'd encounter as a data analyst or data scientist. Many times people would just throw some data at you and ask you to dive into it and find some something useful. Apparently, it's very hard to just magically discover some great things if you don't even know what's relevant. Well, this is when you've got to be a bit more proactive. I think one of the best way to start is to first start with some basic uh, descriptive statistics to at least get some feelings of the data. But then as soon as possible, you should start with a concrete business question. You can get help from a colleague or from someone who knows the business and has good domain knowledge. They can help you explain what you see in the data and formulate some initial ideas. It will give you the chance to think along and really start asking questions. Once you feel ready and confident with your understanding, you can expand your analysis and come up with more ideas and more hypotheses that you can validate. And by this way, there's a better chance that you will actually find something useful. As someone says, the best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. So keep exploring, but be sure to get help when needed. 
Another important tip I want to share with you, and I can't stress this enough, is that you should build a personal portfolio. For example, you can take some Gaggle datasets or any datasets you're interested in analyzing and start tinkering with it. Make some charts, some plots, try out some new techniques that you've never used before, and that's going to become your own little project where you sharpen your analysis or visualization skills, and you can show it to others, including your future employers. I've definitely made a lot of sad attempts trying to create pretty useless stuff that at any given point in time I thought would be interesting to do. To be honest, most of the times they turned out to be a bit less impressive than I would hope, but the more important thing I learned is that they actually gave me a lot of good ideas for my work, some of them eventually became quite successful. The bottom line is, a personal portfolio gives you the chance to hone your skills, to showcase what you've got, and it keeps you learning and being creative. So I hope these tips are helpful to you. And again, all the resources are listed in the video description below in case you want to check them out. And I also want to thank you for some really encouraging comments I received from some of you. I really, really appreciated it. And thank you for the 44 subscribers so far. If you want to see more content related to data science, tech, and careers, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and leave a comment below what you want me to share next. Thank you for watching. I've talked so much. I'm so tired. Bye-bye.